So today we're talking about Romina by Junji Ito. It's one of my favorite books of his. And it has been for a long time, mostly just because it's nonsense. It's hilarious in ways that it does not intend to be. And on the flip side of that, it's absolutely horrific at times. So I just wanted to go through it and explain why I find it so funny in some places and absolutely disturbing in other places. So Romina starts off with a really powerful image of a girl tied to a cross. Which, if you're going to start off a story, um, that's a good way to do it. It immediately piques the interest of the reader because it's like, what? So the story takes place in July 20XX. So when it says July 20XX, that could mean 2024, that could mean 2025, that could mean 2026. We're stopping the joke here. But then you get a flashback to the previous year. So could mean 2023, could mean 2024, depending on if it takes place in 2025, could mean 2025. If so basically there's this professor, he has a daughter, he has discovered a planet that has come out of a wormhole. And he explains what a wormhole is for the reader who doesn't know what a wormhole is. And the professor decides to name the planet that came out of the wormhole, Rabina, after his daughter. Which you go, oh, that's very sweet, that's very nice, but um, we'll see how that works out for her. And this is where we are introduced to Rabina, the girl, not the planet. Romina is one of those characters who, um, she doesn't really have much of a character besides being, like, a pretty girl, being, like, kinda nice. Because really, she's someone who is acted upon as opposed to someone who acts. So it's kinda lame, I think, to make your main character someone who just doesn't do anything, but, um, whatever. But anyways, everyone thinks that she's so beautiful, she just kinda looks like the stock Junji Ito woman character. Because Junji Ito draws about three or four faces, and I mean, that's kind of a thing for a lot of artists where they just kind of draw the same face, and that's fine. But everyone is really hyped up because they're calling this planet Romina, and the girl who the planet is named after is like super hot, so that's a win-win. And then Romina's boyfriend convinces her to go into show business, um, and it's kind of unclear what exactly that means, show business. There's a part where she's on a stage in front of 30,000 people, so it kind of looks like they're doing a play based off of her. Um, so I guess that plays have come back into fashion, like Shakespeare's time, which that's cool, that's cool, I like it. But the whole world's in love with Romina, Romina's pop power beauty, that's out of this world. Everyone loves Romina, she's so cute and beautiful. Like I said, this is her one character trait, is that she's pretty. And this is really the part where I first started laughing. Basically, Romina is this big star now, but she doesn't really care about it. But her boyfriend tells her some great news, which is that she's going to be on a TV commercial. TV commercial for a construction company. And I just found this to be absolutely hilarious because when was the last time you saw a huge pop star do a commercial for a construction company? Imagine if you saw a commercial and it was like, Kesha is now the new face of Lockheed Martin. <laughs> and then they, they adapt her song. So it's like, tick tock on the clock when the bombs don't drop a note. Oh, 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 oh. Britney Spears is now the face of the US Marine Corps. Lady Gaga is the face of Home Depot. I think Lady Gaga would actually make more sense for like a dentist's office, you know, because she has poker face. So I feel like you could work that into a, like a teeth commercial. You guys ever see that dental commercial where they used Dante from the DMC reboot as uh, as like a teeth model? Because the game did so poorly that Ninja Theory had to like sell off assets and so that's where Dante ended up. I think about that every now and then and I'm just like, what a world, what a world we live in. But anyways, Romina, she's kind of scared of getting bigger. She's kind of scared of becoming more popular which is actually something that I very much resonate with. So anyways, Romina has dinner with the head of the construction company who has a son who is in love with her and is very creepy and weird. Which by the way, every man in the book is like completely in love with Romina because again, she's like beautiful. So even if she don't have any notable character traits, she's she's pretty, she's easy on the eyes it says. I mean, she looks kind of normal to me, so I don't, I'm not that attracted to her honestly, but uh, whatever. I'm not a Junji Ito character, I think, I think. Um, Maybe. The son of the construction company's head shows her the secret bomb shelter. He tells her that if anything goes wrong, there's enough room for his family and for her. Which, by the way, I do that anytime I meet a girl for the first time. I just take her to my weird, creepy bomb shelter and say, there's enough space for you, baby. So then we cut back to the professor, to Romina's father, who shows up at the lab and he's like, hey, what's up? And then there's another scientist there who recognizes that Romina's pattern it's, it's Romina's transit across the sky is all screwy and weird. Basically, Romina is approaching Earth and then the guy starts laughing like the Joker and has a mental breakdown because that's what happens whenever anything weird happens. I don't know, I'm kind of tired of that trope because I, I can't really recall ever seeing that in real life where just someone has had a huge breakdown and then they just start laughing maniacally, but maybe, maybe that happens, I don't know. So it's coming to us, he, 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 that's what he sounds like. Oh yeah, by the way, there are floating cars in this um, because it takes place in 20XX. I like this panel where there's like a big like half oval building 
It's kind of cool. Then news gets out that Ramina, the, the planet, Ramina the planet is going to collide with the Earth and everyone starts panicking. Really, this is kind of a book about mass hysteria, which I actually really dig. So Ramina's dad calls her up on her Apple Watch and starts talking to her and says, don't worry, girl, there's no way that the Ramina planet, not you, but the planet will collide with the Earth. That's not going to happen. That's never going to happen. Which, by the way, I feel like anytime anyone says something like, this will never happen, don't worry, this isn't going to happen, this will never happen in a million years, that just makes me worry more. That just makes me feel like you're not telling me the truth, but I don't know, maybe that's just me. Maybe I've just read one too many weird horror stories, but who knows? So then everyone wants to know what's going on because they're like, Ramina, the planet, is going to collide with... R I was going to say Ramina, the Earth, but that's not accurate. Ramina, the planet, is going to collide with the Earth. So Ramina, the girl, tell us what you think. Everyone wants to know what she thinks, like she knows something. But then anyways, it's her birthday, and so they throw her a big birthday party. And so she has an official fan club, and there's this guy with the mustache. Goda is his name. So anyways, the mustache man brings her flowers and says, I'll love you forever. And then the head of the construction company's son comes and he brings her even more flowers. And then he's like, I actually love you. Everyone loves her. But then the thing is that like she already has a boyfriend. So you just have all these guys who are like confessing their love and they're kind of just ignoring the fact that like she's already taken. So the fan club head and the construction company head's son are both fighting over Ramina basically. And then someone throws an egg and it hits Ramina. And then everyone gets mad and they're like, who threw an egg at Ramina? And then her boyfriend's like, don't worry Ramina, no one meant to throw an egg at you. It was definitely meant to go at one of the guys who was fighting over you. But my question is, I'm like, where did they get the egg from? Because it's a party, and this is like an uncracked egg. It's not like a deviled egg, it's just like a regular egg. And so I'm like, who the heck is carrying eggs in their pockets? I mean, tomatoes, sure, but like eggs? I don't know, eggs are fragile, they crack, which is the point. So anyways, Ramina is still wet with the egg yolk whenever a news report comes in. The news report says that Ramina, the planet, has reached the solar system, and it is destroying all the planets. This just in, we have confirmed that Pluto, Neptune, and Uranus have been annihilated. So anyways, all the people are freaking out and they're like, oh, we're doomed, Ramina's coming. And somehow they were able to record in 4K this really cool video of Saturn exploding, which I kind of dig. And then down here on page 32, there's a woman screaming and she just looks like Soichi's mom from the Uzumaki manga. I don't know if it's the same face we're going to compare. But yeah, everyone starts freaking out because they're like, this planet's going to come and destroy us. And then the government's like, don't worry, go to your homes. And again, I feel like if the government tells you not to worry, I feel like that's only going to cause more worrying. But then there's one dude, some nameless character, who comes up with a great theory, which is that the professor and his daughter Ramina are calling the planet Ramina to Earth. They're like summoning it, like some kind of devil or something. I don't know. And then people start freaking out, they start rioting, they're going crazy. Again, like I said, this is a book about mass hysteria. But then somehow everyone hears about this one dude's theory that the planet Ramina is being summoned by the professor and his daughter. And so everyone then at that point just decides to kill Ramina. Everyone's like, hey, let's murder Ramina. Let's get rid of her. That way the planet will stop being called here. And I'm like, makes sense to me. And so then the group, I guess I'll call them the squad, the gang, the fam, the Ramina club, Ramina's posse, they all escape. They fly in this dude's little flying car. And then they see the crowd, and the crowd is holding up crosses because they're going to crucify Ramina and her dad. <laughs> and I don't know, it's just, it's hilarious to me that, like, you want to kill someone, and so your first instinct is to start building crucifixes. And it's like, guys, come on, it's the year 20XX. We don't crucify people at this point. But maybe it's come back into fashion. I don't know. So then astronauts go to investigate Ramina, and there's this giant eye, there's this giant tongue that Ramina has. Ramina the planet, not the girl. I don't know about the girl's tongue. It may be average, it may be large, who knows? Maybe she doesn't have a tongue, because she barely speaks, so that would make some degree of sense. But anyways, all the astronauts die, because the, the planet Ramina is alive, and um, it sucks. It's not safe. It's not habitable. <laughs> And then there's this guy on the news and he explains what's happening and then he's hit over the head with a lead pipe it looks like. And then these dudes who look like Pyramid Head or the KKK or something, anyways, they pop up. They look kind of like the enemies from Dusk also. But anyways, they have these pointed hoods and they're like, oh, we have to kill Ramina. And these guys start sharing that one dude's theory, you know, that one guy in the crowd. These guys are like, if we kill Ramina, everything will go back to normal and everything will be fine. So then Ramina starts crying and then the guys start fighting about who will keep her safe because they're all jealous of each other because they all love Ramina. And then the crowd finds Ramina, Ramina the girl, and they burst into her room and they start trying to kill her and her friends. And I mean, they do kill like one nerdy guy who shows up all of a sudden in chapter two, who's the assistant vice president of the fan club. 
the assistant, the, the vice president of the fan club. Assistant to the vice president. The assistant to the president of the fan club. Anyways, uh, this guy gets shot. But no one cares. Don't come to question all that you've known. Remember you are not alone. I will be here standing beside. But then the astronauts who went to Ramina were able to send back some footage of what Ramina, Ramina the planet, they were able to send back some footage of what Ramina the planet looks like. It's kind of bad. It kind of looks like the eclipse, the berserk eclipse. I don't know. There's, there's a real beauty in it, in a sense. There's a beauty in darkness, I think. So um, I kind of like it. I would set this as my desktop background, not gonna lie. But then the restaurants are like, hey, check this out. There are people waving at us. And then the footage cuts out. So you don't really know what's happening on Ramina the planet. Meanwhile, Ramina the girl is still being chased down and hunted. And then the planet at this point is super close to the Earth. They're about to catch up with Romina's little posse, and then the head of the construction company's son, he kind of uh, is a coward, and so he just says, hey, I'm not part of this group, let me go. So then at this point, Romina's posse consists of Romina the girl of the planet, Romina's boyfriend, and the guy with the mustache who's the head of the fan club. And so they capture Romina and her boyfriend and the guy with the mustache. Romina's boyfriend dies trying to protect her. And this is actually something I really like, is the fact that he dies to a knife. He just gets stabbed and he dies. There's no supernatural horror to it, it's just he's killed by another human being. And I talked a lot about this in my Uzumaki video, but my favorite parts of that book were just all of the non-supernatural stuff. My favorite things about Uzumaki were the things that were really twisted but could happen in real life. And so this is one of them. The crowd is going crazy because they think that killing Romina will stop the destruction of the Earth, and so they just end up killing her boyfriend as collateral damage. And so I really like that, and Romina starts freaking out because her boyfriend's dying, and then the guy with the mustache starts getting jealous. Like, he thought he was her number one for some reason, but he has an ugly mustache, so like, you know, he's like a 4 out of 10 at best. So you have this one guy who's about to kill Romina, and then the evil pointed head executioner guys show up. I like how their eyes are different. I like the guy on the right where he has one eye that's like this and another that's like this. That's kind of cool. But anyways, um, this little cult that forms says that killing Romina is a sacred act. It must be done in a proper space. Bring her. So they take Romina and the mustache guy and they march her through town and the mustache says, I love you more than anyone else possibly could. So I actually think this is a really cool thing about the book because everyone either loves Romina absolutely and is willing to die for her or they hate her and despise her and want to kill her. And I actually kind of love that duality. I think that's a really great approach, especially considering that Romina doesn't have much of a character, honestly. So that's a really good way to make it interesting and to build conflict. Everyone either loves her and adores her and wants to worship her, or they want to kill her and torture her and make her feel pain. And then this is kind of screwed up. At some point, the crowd caught the professor and they tied him to the crucifix. And then um, they do like the Silent Hill 2 thing with the spears where they just like stab him. So they make Romina watch her dad die. And so that's pretty dark. And again, like I was saying, I really like the stuff in this that is non-supernatural. I like the supernatural stuff, but I also like just the stuff that's based in reality. Just because it's dark, it's screwed up. This guy was innocent. The professor didn't do anything wrong. He just detected a planet coming out of a wormhole, as everyone does. And he named it after his daughter, as everyone does. And so he doesn't deserve to be killed with spikes on a crucifix. That's kind of screwed up. So then they put Romina on the cross and they're going to kill her. And then they notice that the eye of Romina the planet opens up and is watching them. And then Romina the planet grows big lips, big sexy succulent lips. This is someone's fetish. And then its tongue comes out of its lips and then it eats the moon. Romina does this to the moon. It goes. <laughs> I often think about how one day my kids will find these videos. I regret nothing. And then people start shooting missiles at the planet Romina's tongue. And then the tongue bounces all the missiles off and then they start landing back on Earth. So then one of them lands in the crowd of people next to the crucifixes and just kills a bunch of people. The mustache man is able to get away from the crowd and he's able to untie Romina from the cross and help her escape. And then the mustache man is like, look, Romina, I saved you. And then she's like crying because she just saw her dad die and because her boyfriend just died. And he's like, Romina, why don't you love me? This is really kind of a book about parasocial relationships, even though those didn't really exist back then, I think. This book came out in like the 90s, so I don't know if parasocial relationships would have been the phrase that they used, but then people have always projected things and desires and hopes onto celebrities and such. 
so um, I kind of think that's what's happening here is the mustache guy, he loves Romina and he wants her to love him as much as he loves her, which is not gonna happen. The mustache man was always kind of a simp, but um, he turns into an Omega simp here. It says, you've always captivated me. You are a beautiful flower. Just looking at you is enough. Yes, I must never do more than look at you. And if someone says that to you, like that's kind of, kind of weird. Um, if I ever receive a comment like that, I think I would laugh, I think I would show people, and then I think I would stay awake all night being scared. After all, he tells her, you belong to all your fans around the world. You can't belong to any one person. And again, that's another thing where it's like, bro, just let the girl be herself. Romina isn't some star for you to worship. She's just a girl. And again, that's kind of the point of the book, I think. I think the point is to show how we idolize celebrities and such. But then the mustache man and Romina run into the head of the construction company's son, the guy who sold them out and ran away. And so the mustache man is rightfully pissed off and threatens to kill the guy and he starts beating the crap out of him. And then Romina says, stop, you're the worst for getting violent like that. But because of the fact that Romina calls the mustache man the worst, he kind of has a breakdown a little bit and he just kind of walks off. He's completely defeated and so he pieces out. So then at this point, it's just Romina and the head of the construction company's son. And so then the son takes Romina the girl to his house. Remember the uh, the bomb shelter that he showed her earlier? Well, that's the idea, is that he's going to hide her in the bomb shelter. And then the head of the construction company and his wife are pissed off at their son for bringing Romina to their home. Since, you know, people still want to kill Romina, just because the crowd dispersed due to the missile fallout, that doesn't mean that people don't want to kill Romina, because they do. But then the head of the construction company says that one of the astronauts who went to Romina very well could be his long lost son, the older brother of this guy who's following Romina around. And of the astronauts that landed on Romina that all like basically died, one of them had a name that's kind of similar to the guy's son. And so because of the shared resemblance in their names, the astronaut who landed on Romina is clearly the head of the construction company's son, the long lost son, the older brother to the guy who's sticking with Romina. So then the son of the head of the construction company, not the long lost son, but the one who's been following Romina around, he takes her to the bomb shelter, where he then tries to assault her, basically. Or not even basically, it's like he literally assaults her, and then she defends herself. He says that Romina seduced him, and he didn't do anything wrong, and she scratched him, and so then the mom starts smacking her around. And that's what I'm laughing at, just the image is kind of silly. And so then the family casts Romina out into the crowd, um, because... Almost every character in this is crappy. And so there's a crowd in front of the family's mansion and there's one of the executioner guys with the pointed hood and the executioner guy whips Romina and tells her to run and they start chasing her. Because again, they can't just kill her because that would be too easy. They want to torture her first for whatever reason. And then there's a huge earthquake because Romina is so close that it's affecting the gravity of the planet. So Romina the girl is able to get away by running down an alleyway and finding a homeless man and then crawling into his little cardboard box with him. And so then the executioner finds them and they take the homeless man and Romina out of the homeless man's little area, his, his home, homeless man's home. And then the homeless guy is like, wait, I'm not involved with this at all, which is 100% true. He didn't do anything. And then they start uh, dunking Romina's head in water. I don't think this is considered waterboarding. If you're like dunking someone's head in water, it's more just attempted drowning. I don't know. Because like with waterboarding, it's like you have the towel over your face and then there's like water and whatever. I I'm done talking about war crimes. Let's move on. So then they hang Romina and the homeless man from a tree and then the executioner just starts whipping her for no reason. Again, at this point, they're just like trying to make her suffer. Like there's no larger purpose to them whipping her. They're just trying to hurt her. And then this is one of the parts that kind of affected me is just the fact that they're just whipping her. They're just beating the crap out of her. And they're beating the crap out of the homeless man and it's just absolutely horrible because again, this is not a supernatural thing. This is people doing this to other people. And so this was one of the moments where I was like, oh crap, this is actually like horrific and disturbing. This isn't quite as funny as it was before. But yeah, they whip her, they cut her up, they cut her face up, it's really bad. And then from there, Romina and the homeless man are taken to where the crosses were before the missiles landed. So then the cross with Romina's dad is still up. He's still tied to it. He's just like a charred corpse at this point though. And then this is where it's really screwed up. They decide to hang Romina and the homeless man up on the crosses. But what they do is they tie Romina directly on top of her father's corpse and they tie the homeless man on the other side of that cross. And so um, it's kind of screwed up to like tie someone to their father's corpse. I mean, just, just a little bit. I mean, that's my opinion though. I don't know. Do you guys have any other opinions? Do you guys think it's okay to tie a girl to her father's burnt corpse? I mean, I don't know. I feel like it's not, but 
I don't know, times are changing, so who really knows. But then the tongue of Romina the planet comes down from the sky and starts licking the earth. And so what happens then is the earth begins to spin. And so at this point, there's only one executioner guy really, and he hops on top of Romina. And then his giant disgusting tongue comes out from underneath his mask and starts licking her. Again, this is someone's fetish. I mean, this is not even like a normal looking tongue. This is just like a, a big tentacle tongue that this executioner guy has. It's kind of a, it's kind of, kind of hot. It kind of makes me want to go, kind of makes me want to go. So anyways, Romina the planet using its tongue starts licking the earth and it causes it to spin. It causes a tsunami and a bunch of storms. So then the crucifix goes flying through the air. And then we cut to the construction company family. You know, the guys who kicked Romina out and um, they're just on this giant rocket ship with like the prime minister of Japan and stuff because they're gonna go and land on Romina the planet. Again, like I said, the construction company head believes that one of the astronauts is his long lost son. And so they're gonna go see him, I guess. Meanwhile, Romina is still tied to her father's corpse and the homeless man is still on the other side of the cross. So at this point, Romina has licked the earth and so it's spinning. And so that means that gravity is all kind of weird. So the executioner jumps down from the cross. He grabs a knife, he cuts Romina off and he just plops her over his shoulder and then he bounces. And so from here, because the gravity is screwed up, the executioner is able to jump with Romina up on top of a building. And then he's able to start slamming her around on the side of a building and he's able to spin her through the air. And it's just kind of absurd. It's just kind of silly. He's like literally spinning her with one arm. And so, I don't know, it's just, it's hard to take seriously. But you know, the homeless man, he could easily peace out. He could easily just run away and be like, hey, this girl caused me a bunch of suffering. But no, no, he's a good virtuous guy. And so he goes and he saves her. He's able to fight the executioner off of her. And then he takes her and then he bounces around the world with her. And so at this point, they land in a giant crevice caused by Romina, the planet's tongue. And so the wind is very strong there. And so it's able to just push them across the world. So the homeless man carrying Romina takes her across the world. And behind them, there's a huge group of people who are still trying to kill Romina. Even though the earth is already like spinning and is screwed up and, and whatever else, they're still trying to kill Romina because what else are you gonna do when the world's ending, I guess? So then we cut back to the construction company's family and the prime minister, everyone who has landed by now on planet Romina. And there's some really dope art here. I actually love this. I love all the shots of the planet Romina. It's just very strange. It's very Lovecraftian. And I think that Junji Ito did a great job with the art in this one. So then um, the construction company's family, they're all crappy people. And they're like, hey, is it safe to breathe in the air here? It's like a reddish purple gas. And so then the head of the construction company is like, oh, I have a great idea. Some people got injured whenever we landed here on the planet Romina. We're just gonna take off one of their helmets and see if they die. And then, um, yeah, they take off the helmet of this guy and then he immediately dies and his face immediately melts. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of screwed up to die like that. And then the head of the construction company and his family and the prime minister and everyone else, they realize that Romina really is a demon planet. It's hell, they say. And I think it's probably just a bad idea all around to, to try to land on, on planets that are coming to consume the earth. But um, I guess you just do the best you can in a situation like that. Because it's like, hey, the earth is getting destroyed, but you know this planet is also horrible. So it's kind of a lose-lose. But anyways, uh, Romina the planet just ends up kind of devouring all the astronauts who landed on its surface. It just kind of eats everyone and destroys them all. And then Romina the planet licks the earth one more time and it causes the world to stop spinning. And then all these people who were in the air freaking fall down and die. And they're just all dead. And, and I actually kind of really like that detail. It's really gross and really dark, but I, I dig it. I'm a big fan of it. But the homeless man and Romina are still alive. They're still prevailing. And Romina for like the last like one or 200 pages has just kind of been crying because you know, her dad died and her boyfriend died. And so she hasn't done anything the whole freaking book. Literally, it's just the homeless man trying to save her. So then he and Romina stumble upon a group of other people and the homeless man is like, hey guys, come along, come with us. And then the homeless man goes to the head of the construction company's house. And the homeless man is trying to get into the head of the construction company's house. And then all of a sudden the executioner shows up once more for a final time and he just starts whipping Romina. He just starts beating the crap out of her. And then the executioner accidentally takes his own hood off of his head and it's revealed, hey, the executioner, this guy is the mustache guy. Remember him, the mustache guy, the head of the fan club? Anyways, um, Romina rejected him and so now he wants to make her suffer and he's a scumbag. Surprise, surprise, people who are celebrity obsessed probably don't have the most stable personalities. Who would have thought? But anyways, um, so this guy's crazy and then he gets kicked off and um, dies, I guess. And so from here, the homeless man is able to get into the bomb shelter, the one that the, uh, the, the kid assaulted Romina in. 
and everyone gets in there and then Romina devours the earth and then the bomb shelter just gets launched into space. And there's some really cool art here. I really love the depiction of Romina devouring the earth. It's really just kind of gross and scary. <laughs> and so Romina, the homeless man, and their new random friends are all safe. They're all floating through space. And then it's revealed that, um, you know how the head of the construction company, he thought that the astronaut who landed on Romina was his son? Nope. It was the homeless man. The homeless man was the guy's son all along. And so that's how he knew about the bomb shelter. And it was just a, a genius stroke of luck that Romina happened to stumble upon him. And then the homeless man reveals that the bomb shelter only has enough necessities to last one year. So essentially they have one year out in space. The homeless man tells everyone, the real tough times are just beginning. Outside's the endless void of space and the shelter's only good for a year. But you never know, he says, there may be another miracle in that year. Ha 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 ha. So then everyone celebrates and they're all like, woo, we're floating through space. And then Romina just kind of stares and then she's watching the earth fade away. And um, she's sad about her dad still, which I mean, come on, he died like 200 pages ago. So like, get over your dead dad, Romina. So Romina is still butthurt about her dad dying and about her boyfriend dying and she's like, <laughs> But yeah, the book kind of ends on a downer note, which is that Romina and her little posse are able to escape the Earth, but they might die in space, and um, that that's it for them. That's it for them. I think this is one of Junji Ito's more interesting stories just because of the human element. So much of the story is driven by people. It's driven by individuals who are trying to make other individuals suffer. So much of the plot is driven by people who don't really know what's going on and they're just trying their best to figure it out. And I think this story has a lot of unintentionally comedic moments and just a lot of stuff that, that made me laugh really hard. But then also there are a lot of things about it that are, are legitimately horrific and disturbing and, and dark and um, would probably happen if this book happened in real life. I talked about this idea in my humor and horror video, but I think that in any horror work, there has to be an up and a down. I think that you have to have moments that are very, very scary and make the work legitimately a horror piece. And then I think that you also need moments of calmness and peace and even humor. You need something that can release the tension a little bit, which will then allow you to build it back up and allow more scares to happen further down the line. And so I think that the comedy in this, uh, I, like I said, I don't think it's intended. I don't think that Junji Ito intended the reader to laugh at any point during this work, but for me, the comedy made the horror, the realistic horror, that much more effective. And again, I really dig the ending. I really like the idea of just saying, well, everyone's safe, but like, are they really better off? Are they really going to be better off in this bomb shelter floating through the void of space? Or would it have been better if they had perished on Earth with everyone else? So I really like this book. Give it a shot if you haven't read it. It's actually one of my favorite stories by Junji Ito. But thank you for watching. Have a nice night. Um, don't name any plants after your daughters. I think that's the real moral of the story actually is if a planet comes through a wormhole or if you discover something weird in space, don't name it after your daughter. Because if you name it after your daughter, they might literally crucify you and you might burn. But anyways, um, thank you for watching. Have a nice night and uh, bye.